Joining us now on the Folsom Lake Honda Hotline, Folsom Lake Honda, your one-stop Honda shop. He's the host of the Purple Insider podcast at Blue Wire Pods and has a new book out, Football is a Numbers Game, Pro Football Focus, and how a data-driven approach shook up the sport. I told JJ before we brought him on, I know this man well. The biggest football fan, I would even go so far as to say football nerd I know. It's a really? pleasure to welcome in Matthew Collar. Matthew, how are you this afternoon, my man? Uh, I take this as a compliment. I mean, I figured, Rami, when I started writing the book, I had you in mind as someone who just can't get enough football analytics in their life. <laughs> you know you know, I love the analytics. I just deep, dive deep into the numbers, Collar. What made you want to write this book? For those who don't, I know why you wanted to write this book, but for those who don't know Matthew Collar the way I do, what made you want to write this book? Yeah, actually, I mean, football uh, analytics – uh, have really been a, a big part, uh, I guess, of my career. I mean, not just football, but all sports analytics, really, because even when I was going back to uh, when I was first breaking in the industry, calling minor league baseball games, which I used to tell you about all the mm -hmm. time when we worked together, and uh, then I covered some hockey when I worked in Buffalo, and then the journey took me here to cover the Minnesota Vikings, and it's sort of always been a guidepost for me. And also, uh, I've learned a lot of really interesting stories through following the data. So of course, when we think about data, we always think of like boring, it ruined baseball, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> but what I, what I found is, you know, especially with pro football focus, that has been the most influential company uh, uh, forward facing and behind the scenes in the NFL is it's kind of gone through its money ball moment over the last couple of years um, that I started to feel like the analytics revolution had hit. Uh, when it came to football, that it was changing. Like, look at the, how much running backs are getting paid or fourth downs or how teams are, are stacking up their analytics department. And then, you know, the Minnesota Vikings hiring Quasi Adafalmenta as their analytics GM. And it was like, okay, I, I'm looking around thinking this is no longer the neck roll NFL from back in the day <laughs> uh, where teams are just talking about running the football, playing defense. Like, the conversation is really changing. And also, I had gotten to know a lot of people at PFF and – there is a Billy Bean of this story. It's just that no one's ever heard of him. His name is Neil Hornsby, who started PFF in his house in England about you know, 15 years ago. Wow. And uh, it's kind of a crazy story of just a guy who loved football and wanted to understand it better and sort of accidentally backed into creating this company that all 32 huh. NFL teams use and lean on every day. Matt, tell me something as I sit here and look at the book. And of course, we haven't had the opportunity. I'm just going to go ahead and blame Rami that I haven't got a copy yet. But <laughs> Matt, tell me uh, something within the book that you still are amazed that you've learned. Like, man, I, I can't even believe that. thought you knew everything and yeah. then you found that. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, Rami couldn't even give me his home address. So oh, I, I told you. <laughs> and he said, I don't have an address at the moment. So like, okay, well, I'll get you. So I'll send it to the radio station or something. I don't know. But uh, that, I'm not taking blame. You know, I think the, the biggest thing that uh, amazed me is really just how much PFF is a part of the everyday operations of the NFL. I mean, how they got to be that way is the whole book. And it's really the origin story, which is totally insane of how it all came together. But uh, they invented a program uh, or an, I guess like an application that you could put on every computer in the building that ties together data and the video. And we know that football people are obsessed with the tape, right? But what PFF does for them is you can type in, if you want to know how your team did in the red zone, if you're in the coaching staff, every red zone situation and they, their data will tell you what defense other teams played against you, who the targets were, for wide receiver, how many yards you gain, what the grades were on each player. And of course the grades are always a big debate. Uh, and there's a lot of different feelings about the grades within the NFL. Uh, but um, if people think that no one's using them in the NFL, they are very much. And I tell some stories uh, about the different ways that they're used. Um, but that kind of blew my mind of just every coaching staff is using this every single day. And the quarterback coach of the Los Angeles Rams told me that the, their operations would take so much longer and be so much more difficult to study what they want to learn about what they want to coach up if they did not have this PFF system that they've created. So I had no idea going into it that these NFL teams were using it to the level that they are. So we think of analytics as being like, oh, 
don't punt. Well, that's come along, and teams have stopped punting so much, but there's just so many more layers to data and how it's used. I, I talked to a legendary offensive line coach who went through the PFF grades and looked for the bad ones. And when he saw a bad one, he would review the tape of it so he could coach up his player on what went wrong. So even though that's not like traditionally the way we think of analytics, it's using this data set to influence his coaching, to save him a lot of time. And that, I I mean, I just had no idea this was going on behind the scenes. And the NFL coaches and stuff, they're not really talking about it. They're not coming out and saying, oh, yeah, we're using – this system all the time they'll instead say we don't care about their grades we watch our own tape um that's kind of been the standard line but there's just so much more that they're using data for and then it's the other thing too was the the levels that it's growing at like how quickly it started growing after and the reason the eagles are on the the front as the cover is after the eagles won their super bowl uh, through a data-driven approach and even used a play um, that kind of uh, was, uh, you know, kind of driven by PFF data to win the Super Bowl. So after teams started seeing them doing that, it was a great influence for other teams to follow a lot of things that they do, as we've always seen, right? Like it's kind of a copycat league. You hear that? Well, now it's copycatting on the analytics side as well, and it's starting to grow exponentially. Even since I finished writing the book, I've seen a lot of different innovations and things coming out that teams are starting to use and build up their analytics department. So I think this is just sort of the beginning uh, of scratching the surface of what teams are going to do in in the coming years. You mentioned talking with Matthew Collar. Check out his new book, Football is a Numbers Game at Amazon or wherever books are sold. You mentioned how running backs are valued and and something we're going to talk about at 3 o'clock here with the the Josh Jacobs situation and Saquon Barkley in in New York. Has the way running backs are used changed over the last 30 40 years Matthew or have the numbers just shown the the true value of a running back and that's why you're seeing the situations that we see today yeah so that's really interesting and this kind of dives into another level of analytics where there's there's sort of the numbers and the data and everything else and then there's data science which is really the study of what all that data that we've gathered means and this does tie into running backs I promise So one of the things that Chris Collinsworth, uh, who owns PFF, was at the forefront of was hiring data scientists because he knew they had all these numbers but wanted to know what they mean. And the more that running backs were studied by data science, they found some consistent things. I mean, one of them is the age curve, which you guys all know about if you play fantasy football. If a running back is 29 and he just carried the ball 400 times, don't you know? pick him in fantasy. Everybody knows that. But also the impact of blocking and just how much we can actually quantify how much is blocking and how much is the actual running back. And then the other layer of analytics, which I think makes football so compelling in July uh, and March and you know, when they're not playing, is that it's also being played at a front office level as well with the salary cap. It's not just on the field and X's and O's and scheme, but it's also how you manage your money. So PFF invented a wins above a placement metric, which is not public, but it is behind the scenes with teams. And it's one of those things where running backs are pretty replaceable and they've been able to really put dollar figures on how replaceable they are. And so that's why, you know, guys like Saquon Barkley, who I watched in person twice against the Vikings last year, and oh my God, is that guy good at football? <laughs> but how but how good in comparison to what you could replace him for for almost no money and then where do you spend that other money on positions that have more wins above replacement value so it's complicated but it's really you can see it influencing the nfl that 10 years ago i saw the stat on twitter today the franchise tag was higher for running back 10 years ago than it is now which is absurd because Uh. every other position is shot through the roof and the data science behind it is influencing that and sorry to some great running backs who are kind of the victim of this. You know, Matthew, as a guy who's not so much as tied as the analytic guy, of course, being a fan of the, the Oakland A's and Billy Ball and all that type of stuff, I like to trust my eyes. So I'm going a, I'm to a switch, uh, switch flavors here for you real quick. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Kirk Cousins. There are people who, like myself, believe the Vikings have some great teams up there, but because Kirk Cousins has been the QB, they haven't really been able to uh, grasp the championship. What's your thoughts on that, my man? 
Yeah, I think with uh, Kirk Cousins specifically and, and, you know, quarterback here on Netflix has helped his brand uh, a lot, I think, by showing behind the scenes how much goes into playing quarterback and, uh, you know, his toughness and dedication and everything. But I think what you have is there's a group of aliens that are playing in the NFL and that are, you know, Mahomes, uh, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, that are just playing a different game than everyone else. And then there's another group of cheap quarterbacks that we we're just talking about. And this is really an analytics kind of thing is that, you know, the cheap quarterbacks can be average, but the team around them can be so good that it elevates to the point where, you know, a Jared Goff a couple of years ago makes the Super Bowl or the Philadelphia Eagles again with, with Nick Foles, they had a rookie quarterback contract at that point. And Kirk Cousins falls just in the wrong spot. He's not an alien. He's not Patrick Mahomes. He's not mobile. He's not physically gifted uh, outside of being an accurate quarterback. And he's also not cheap. I think the Vikings probably could compete for a Super Bowl if Kirk Cousins made $5 million. But when there are uh, someone who's more talented, like Jalen Hurts, who's making way less and they could put way more into the roster, it's really an unfair advantage. Um, but, it, I mean, it's within the rules, so it's obviously fair, but it's something that teams have kind of figured out. And when Philadelphia got rid of Carson Wentz, a lot of people went, what are they doing? This guy went, you know, had an MVP season. Why are they drafting Jalen Hurts? Well, it's because Wentz is probably just okay and decent at his best and also was about to become very expensive. So it, it's become a, a hack. And Kirk Cousins, unfortunately, fits in the wrong spot there where he's expensive, but also not a freak show. And I think that's caused them to be just weak enough roster-wise to never really break through. Have you seen the uh, the Netflix documentary with Kirk? I mean, what do you think? Did I see it? Did I see it? Of course. Uh, of course. Of course. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of really cool scenes with him, honestly. I mean... I, you know, covering, yeah, I've, covering I've heard a lot of people say that he's sort of the surprise star of the thing that he comes off kind of endearing and likable. A hundred percent. He's the winner of this thing. And Kevin O'Connell probably is also the winner. You knew how awesome the homes was. Mm -hmm. And you also knew how lame Mariota is. So you're not surprised <laughs> by any of that. But, but I think what I really think what is on display here, Kirk's personality for sure is on display. Uh, but you know, they lost the game against the Giants and they showed his drive home with his wife where he's going over the plays that he's going to regret and think about and stuff. That's something you'll never see. Huh. And so the other thing is just how beat up he was last year from the hits that he took. I mean, everybody knew he was taking a lot of hits, but not to the point where, you know, he could really barely get on the field. It was still grinding it out. So I think there's kind of a new respect for Kirk Cousins after watching that. That's Matthew Collar. You can follow him on Twitter at Matthew Collar. And if you go there, you'll see his pinned tweet with a link to go buy his new book. Football is a numbers game, pro football focus, and how a data-driven approach shook up the sport. Always appreciate it and good catching up, my man. Let's do it again soon, Matthew Collar. All right. And when you get an address, let me know. Thanks, Ronnie. I will do that. And he joins us on the Folsom Lake Honda hotline. Folsom Lake Honda. Yeah, get that man. You're a one stop man. Honda shop. Cold blood. You more cold blooded than I thought, brother. <laughs> it's not that simple. Get a P.O. box, it's man. It's not that. I should get a P.O. box. Come on, box. brother. As much moving as I've done. <laughs> I should get a P.O. box. We'll hit a quick break. On the other side, hilarity struck at the Tour de France yesterday. We'll discuss.